Well, hello. Um, welcome, Dr. Catherine Mannix, and thank you very much for joining me to talk today about many topics, I hope. Um, and for those of you, well, most people watching will know will know you, Catherine, but I'm going to embarrass you now, and I'm going to embarrass you with the blurb from one of your fantastic books, um, which describes you very neatly. And I know you, you think um, it's blowing blowing a trumpet, but um, I'm sure it's not, and I'm sure it's very accurate. It says Dr. Catherine Mannix has spent her medical career working with people who have incurable advanced illnesses, starting in cancer care and changing career to become a pioneer in palliative medicine. She has worked as a palliative care consultant in hospices, hospitals, and patients' own homes, optimizing quality of life even as death is approaching. And Catherine, I know you're passionate about public education. You qualified in cognitive behavioral therapy in 1993, and you started, according to the book, probably one of the first or the world's first uh, CBT clinic exclusively for palliative care patients and devised CBT first aid. And you've written two books. This is one of them. Really recommend it um, with the end in mind. Not a very cheery title, um, but a fat fantastic book. And also Listen, which again, um, I really recommend. And some of the topics that come up in, in that book, I'd really like to touch on. And just quickly, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rob, Rob Tobin. I'm, I work at Kennedy's as a healthcare lawyer, so I specialise in medical law and the firm's uh, the medical law lead in the UK. And we deal with a lot of, sadly, a lot of cases involving end of life treatment. And I suppose to introduce the, the discussion today, what I'll say and the reason why I wanted to have this chat, Catherine, is because I get a lot of phone calls, sometimes in the middle of the night, sometimes more more civilised time from either from the legal team at a hospital or the doctors themselves. And what will what will they will say is that they have a patient on the ward or perhaps in ITU who doesn't have capacity. They may well be unconscious and there's a choice, there's a decision that needs to be made at that at that moment a life or death decision about whether or not to give certain treatment uh, or whether or not to give no treatment at all other than palliative treatment. And the question our laws ask is, well, what do the patient want? What, you know, what, have, they get, have they expressed any wishes? What are their values, wishes and feelings, i.e. what are in their best interests? And from a medical perspective, that's easy often. The doctor can tell me that this treatment is, is likely to be futile or it's likely to cause a lot of harm to the patient. But they won't really be able to tell me what are their overall best interests because they don't know the person. So starting off, I suppose, from, from your perspective, with your, all of your experience in this area, how do you encourage a person, who, before even they're a patient perhaps, or perhaps when they are a patient, to communicate and write down those wishes, values and feelings? That's, that's the six million dollar question, isn't it? And I guess we're talking about people who might at some point become patients. We're talking about people, aren't we? We're talking about the fact that we're mortal. Maybe, that, maybe it's worth starting there. Anybody who's ever going to die is likely to have a phase of living where their death becomes increasingly possible and it may or may not be temporarily preventable by medical intervention. So a person who has had a massive heart attack, drops their blood pressure, loses consciousness, blue light is into hospital, people survive heart attack, but we need to do some fairly intensive things to them to support them through those first hours and days in order that they can survive their heart attack and they live usually a healthy life afterwards. But many of them have problems with a heart that isn't as robust as it previously was. And some people find that annoying and other people find that devastating because it's interrupted all of their meaningful activities that are based on exercise and good 
can't function. So would that person have wished that they hadn't had those intense medical treatments around about that time? Well, a very, very small number of them might do. Whereas another person might be at the very end stages of, of an, a, an illness that has been known to be going to cause their death and their dying. And as they approach the end of their life, they are likely to follow a pattern that's very familiar to us all that includes increasing tiredness and weariness and being asleep to recharge their energy batteries and eventually lapsing into unconsciousness. So we've got these two different close to death unconscious people, for one of whom there are treatment possibilities and for the other one there are no treatment possibilities, nothing's going to stop the approach of their dying. And they might be the same person at different phases in the same illness. So how do we have conversations about what to do if I'm so sick that I might die? And there are possibilities to rescue me. And what would you do differently? What would I want to happen differently if I was so sick that I was almost certainly dying and there weren't medical possibilities? And that's a conversation that all of us could have today. It would be a, a kind of blind conversation for most of us today because we wouldn't know the precise kind of circumstances that were likely to pertain as our dying is approaching. But at some point in our lives, we'll start to collect the illnesses that will be the things that are likely to kill us. And at that point, we can start to finesse those wishes, that advice that we would give to families. So, you know, I'm in my early 60s, I'm relatively fit, I'm a runner. Um, my family all know what my thoughts are about how I would like to be cared for if the end of my life was approaching, because it would be a bit crazy for me to be jumping up and down about this and not having made those kinds of wishes explicit to my family. But they're not written down. And they're not written down because at the moment they are too vague. But as life goes on and I develop an illness, begin to get dementia, get a cancer diagnosis, find that I've got some unexpected lung disease, whatever it is, we can start to be able to say, OK, well, if that's the way it's going to be, there are some things that I would want to avoid happening. I would want to avoid being a burden to my family. I would want to avoid being supported only by machines in a hospital setting. Um, for me, actually, the thing that are, is most important is about my quality of living rather than my length of life. But if you're, because you're, you being who you are, uh, as you say, it would be surprising to say the least if you hadn't had those conversations with your family but for someone else who isn't a palliative care doctor who hasn't written various books on, on on all of these topics and I'm talking about the families here rather than the clinician patient relationship yeah. how do they how does a how's a how does a uh, a an adult uh, son or daughter of uh, a relatively elderly person, let's say, who's not got any chronic illness, they're in their 80s, but they're, they're well. How do they start that conversation with their mother or father so that if something does happen, and it may be an, an acute event, if that does happen unexpectedly, um, they're prepared for it and they know what their wishes and feelings and values are. Mm, it's a great question. And, and there are many people who are in that situation. My correspondents, I get uh, letters from people saying, I need to have this conversation with you know, my, my elderly parents. I also get letters from elderly parents saying, I'm trying like mad to tell my family what I want as my life draws to a close and they will not have this conversation with me. So the first thing is that I think we're all making an assumption that the other party won't want to have this conversation, but we haven't tested that assumption. So it might 
be that we we're pushing on an open door and i think the door metaphor is, is is a useful one because we can knock on the door without actually barging straight through it so one of the things that i see happening is um, that the, the well-meaning getting things sorted out member of the family decides to impose this conversation on an older relative you know we we need to we need to talk about this we need to talk about it now and that kind of ruptures the agreed relationship between these two people if this is if this is your parent or you know a, a, an aunt or uncle that you've been very close to through your life and they they they're relying on you in their older age you know we need to respect the fact that once upon a time this person taught us to use a spoon um and so how can we go into that conversation giving them the dignity of the the status that they have in our relationship of a parental figure so my advice to people is to use the fact that this is a parent or, a, or an adult who's concerned about our well-being too, even though the conversation is about their well-being. I, Dad, Uncle Henry, there's this thing on my mind, and it's concerning me, it's causing me to worry a bit. It would be really helpful to me if I could talk to you about it and get your advice and your opinion about it. Yeah. So there's an invitation, there's a knock on the door. And you can open the door a little bit so you can name the dance you're inviting them to, to say, what I'm actually worrying about is if I ever had to speak for you about your health, because I guess I'm the person the doctors would ask, and I'm not sure what you might want. So we don't have to talk about it now, but it would put my mind at ease if we could just toss the ideas around a little bit just just for a while sometime in the next little while mm. and what you might find is the door now is drawn wide open by uncle henry saying i thought you'd never ask i was wondering how i was going to talk to you about it or somebody puts their foot firmly behind that door and says oh can't we talk about something a bit more pleasant and that way you know how you're going to feel your way into that conversation but i think we make the mistake of thinking We've got to name it, have the conversation and complete it all in one fell swoop rather than opening it up for conversation and then just doing it in bite-sized chunks as the other person is comfortable to deal with it. Yeah. And you talk a lot um, and in your TED Talks and in your, in your books about stories, telling stories and, and the power of stories to either open a conversation or have a difficult conversation so how would you how would you go about giving context perhaps to some of these difficult conversations for people what does it there, there are there are things come up in the news media don't they or there are there are themes on um soap operas or you you I've been reading a book and there was this interesting situation in it and there was a person in it who found themselves in a situation that you and I might find ourselves in and I thought gosh I, I wouldn't know what to do then and I wonder whether you know what you would want us to do then stuff on the radio so we can use other people's stories and and bring them to be the kind of trigger for a conversation that we know we need to have and and i think that they feel daunting don't they these conversations because generally if we're talking to a family member it's a person we're fond of and we're concerned that we might be going to cause them to be distressed by mentioning the fact that they might possibly at some point in the future get so sick that their life is under threat where we, when in fact most people as they age, increasingly think about that. I think I think Shakespeare refers to it as every every third thought, doesn't he? And so often taking the initiative to just knock on the door, say, I've been thinking about this, or um, I don't I don't watch Coronation Street, but I know you do, Auntie Flo. 
and I've heard that there's been this story on. What did you make of it? Because it made me wonder about, and you're into the conversation. Because mm. we certainly have a real gap in in our knowledge base. I mean, as as a lawyer who's helping helping the trusts team to to work out uh, a best interests decision, and sadly, we have sometimes have to go to court to get a judge to make that decision. And the, the the gap in evidence is so often that lack of either either the conversation that a loved one or someone else who knows the person can explain to a judge, or better still, a lack of um, written documentation, advanced decisions, um, or even just a, a long list of wishes and values. Do you? I mean, this is a very political loaded question because I know the answer is if it, if I was a GP I'd say well I haven't got time for this but is there a role in primary care for maybe it's a new a new role for someone or a group to invite those discussions with people before their patients perhaps when they reach a certain age or, or if they have a certain diagnosis to just invite someone to write down their wishes and values so that that document or those documents can form part of the evidence for for the future so we're moving now from talking to families to some kind of medical yeah thinking about wishes so two things to say about this i think first of all to just round off the conversations with families families don't in general know lots of medical stuff um and so they don't start the conversation because they don't know how to have the medical stuff conversation but actually a conversation with families can be as simple as what are the things that matter most to this person so you know if you're a middle-aged man where running is your passion and being able to run is your passion. And there's a decision to be made where your life could be saved, but your legs will be amputated or your lungs will never support you to run again. That's a different conversation from a person who's quite content to sit in an armchair, listen to music, read their papers and books. So families can have conversations very easily about what but, are the things that make your life worth living. Sorry to interrupt you, but on, on, on that note, because we let, let's say that the, the person who, who enjoys running what I suppose what might be very difficult or even impossible for that person to envisage is how far they would go before deciding their life is not worth living so Absolutely. yes at the moment yeah. they, they love running but maybe they would accept and tolerate tolerate is probably a better word a life in, a, in, a, in an armchair if other factors grandchildren or loved ones or whatever it was or even just doing the crossword was still still around for them yeah I, I think that's true and I kind of oversimplified really just to 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 kind of make the point for for families that we can understand what really matters to people and that that changes over a lifetime and also you're absolutely right what people find they can accommodate often surprises them so I've I've had patients who've said to me well you know I, I can tolerate having this um, this cancer condition that I've got, for example, slowing me down. I can't do the gardening as well as I used to, but I can still get outside in the fresh air and, you know, it's it's bearable. And I got my potatoes in, but I might have to get my grandson to dig my potatoes up. But if I ever was reduced to being in a wheelchair, I'd rather be dead then. And then in six months time, that person develops spinal cord compression they are now unable to move their legs unable to control their bladder and bowels they are in a situation that they previously would have described as utterly untenable i'd rather be dead and there they are brimming themselves on the edge of the vegetable patch directing the digging up of the vegetables and saying yeah I, you know it's not great is it and i do i do wish it wasn't like this but you know it's all right and as long as x doesn't happen because if that happened i would really rather be dead and people keep moving the goalposts because they do 
accommodate because you're right other things compensate and there are things that make being alive worthwhile that perhaps we didn't notice until the bigger things to the front of our attention are removed and that's what makes it so difficult isn't it in the court of protection to think about that really nuanced what would still be worthwhile in the life of this person rather than any other person so your question about planning ahead on a more um, organised basis from policy of some sort, does it need to be primary care? I don't, I don't know. So let's separate the who does it from the, the how. When you uh, reach a certain birthday in this country, you're offered your um, childhood immunizations and then as you get older you're offered different sorts of health screening um, why don't we send out planning ahead literature on I don't know arbitrarily I'm going to choose 50th birthday young enough that for most people it doesn't feel relevant yet but a birthday that's of significance because you're halfway to 100 and increasingly people are living to be 100 and that we get reminders every five years to just get that out and have a look at it and bring it up to date in case your health status has changed, in case your uh, other commitments, family commitments have changed, in case your finances have changed, because nothing is certain in life apart from death and change, really. Um, and then once that illness that might start to change our lives declares itself, Again, you can start to finesse those things. And we don't do that in this country, but they do do it in the USA. And their uptake of advanced care planning is bigger because insurance companies are driven by the financial imperative of not make wasting their presumably um, shareholders' money by making sure that people have planned not to have incredibly expensive but not helpful to them treatments towards the end of their lives. Um, so we have relatives in America and they just get an email with an attachment and it's the Record My Wishes booklet and it's fascinating and it's quite an interesting booklet. It's quite well written as you would expect. We could easily do that and we could easily then think about who would be the support person who would sit with the individual and perhaps their family members to broker the conversation that results in the actual words that are written in mm. the record. And I wonder whether even if, if it's cost effective for medical insurance companies in the States, would the saving of unhelpful but expensive treatments and the focusing on more helpful and often less expensive treatment for the National Health Service fund the workforce that could actually help to broker those conversations. Uh, I'm sure it could, not to mention the the cost of court of protection applications. Yeah. But uh, you, you use the, the analogy in, in one of your books about birth plans. You know, at the beginning of life or beginning of someone's life, their parents will be asked, particularly the, the, the pregnant mum will be asked to, if she wants to, to produce a birth plan. Mm. Now it's not a, in many experiences, including my wife's experience, it gets thrown out the window at the end because it's nothing is, nothing happens as you plan it. But um it happens at that stage, so why couldn't it happen at a different stage for the end of life? And and one of the things about birth plans, there are lots and lots of parallels between getting ready for a birth and giving birth and getting ready for dying and doing the dying. Mm. But, but birth plans are a really good illustration of that because although we, we know that birth plans go off piste and good midwives encourage people to have a, a, a what if plan B and even a what if plan C as well. And as people are invited to make those backup plans, what starts to distill out from that is what's most important. And it turns out to be things like the baby is all right. 
Mm. Um, my birth partner is allowed to be present. Um, I'm conscious enough to be able to hold the baby as soon as the baby is born. Um, and I'm prepared to put up with discomfort and uh, being um, given treatments that aren't comfortable for me, provided these core values that often become enshrined more clearly as you get to the what if plan C stage of discussion. So if we're going to talk about end of life planning, everybody will have an idealised end of life plan. I'm going to be in my bedroom looking out of my window being able to see my garden and the park across the lane and it's all going to be lovely and all the right visitors are going to come and they're all going to be in a good mood and I'm not going to be incontinent but actually I'm not silly and I know that I need a plan B and I need a plan C and so what I'm able to say to my family at this stage and will be able to say to my medical advisors later on is actually what happens isn't really as important to me as what doesn't happen where do I not want to be? What treatments do I really not want to have? What do I not want my adult children to have to watch happening to me? And we can distill those things out. And we know that people can't require and demand uh, treatments that aren't applicable for them, but they have the right in law to decline, even for ridiculous reasons, treatments that would be applicable to them. Um, and maybe the fact that I want to be able to see my apple tree is a ridiculous reason. But it's my reason for not wanting to be in a hospital. Yeah. And one of the you mentioned values there. Uh, and I think values and it is this distinction. I know there's a massive overlap, but there's a distinction between values and wishes and feelings. And some of them are more. Specific around treatment or, or not tre no treatment whichever it, it is someone may or may, may not want and other things like values are more nuanced and very personal um, and you know religion will, will come into it sometimes but certainly these days where I imagine clinicians will come across many many more patients than they used to who perhaps don't follow a, an organized religion or haven't in their in their lifetime but they still nonetheless have very strong values about something or other and it may be about um, whether or not their loved ones are with them at the end or as you say the, whether or not they they get they get to see their apple tree blossom or something like that and that those those are often lost in in the communications and the evidence use that legal word at the end and and i suppose that's another aspect that people need to be encouraged to talk about or write down yeah i, I think that's absolutely right and what would be really lovely would be to create a document that is um Sometimes when children are starting school or moving from one school to another school, they make a book called an All About Me book. Mm. And it has pages that just offer prompts and you uh, draw and write things that it's really important that you know about me. These are things I love. These are the people who are important to me. These are things I hate. Um, we could really use a grown-up version of that um, what we're really doing is we're distilling down to the question that um, Harvey Kochinov is a, um, a Canadian psychiatrist um, who's done a lot of research and pioneered a form of, of care called dignity therapy. But it distills down to this question, what do I need to know about you as a person in order to give you the best care? that I can. And that question is about who you are, what matters to you most, what are your values, what are your preferences, who, who is your village? And your village might be your massive family around the world, or it might be the lady two doors down and your cat. And we need to know that because those are all important things in bringing the best possible understanding of you with us. 
when we're trying to serve you at the bedside. So we can get very hung up on trying to drill into under what circumstances would you agree to a blood transfusion. But actually, three steps back from that, there's a conversation that isn't terribly difficult to have, which is about wishes and preferences and values. And towards the end of people's lives, they're very often making, I, I, I'm going to call it a spiritual reckoning, and I'm separating spirituality here from religion. They are judging the life that they've had and the way they lived it against the values that matter to them, which might be about being part of a, a loving family, or it might be about surviving against difficult odds. Or it might be a, a religious thing. Have I been, you know, a, a, a good enough Buddhist? Have I been a sufficiently faithful Jew? Wh whatever their paradigm might be. So it's far easier at that stage in people's lives to be able to ask them questions about those preferences, those things that make them be a person they feel is worthy. And these are lovely questions lovely conversations to have with people. These are conversations about reminiscence, they're about joys and regrets, they're about hopes, they're about the things that really matter and how I've celebrated them in the past and how I'd like myself to be remembered and celebrated after I've died. And that sounds like it could be a, a mournful conversation, but actually they're usually uplifting conversations. I guess in the same way as when you go online and look at reviews of at the end in mind, you see people saying, this was surprisingly uplifting. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is that when we really stop and think about the fact that we're mortal makes every day precious and it makes us much more appreciative of what's going on around us. So talking about the preciousness is not as difficult a conversation as you might imagine before you embark on it. Mm. And when those conversations are had particularly those between amongst family or you know other loved ones sometimes there is a almost a conflict in in terms of what is what is in the person's best interest what do they want because and i'll give an example i, I was involved in a case last or a couple of years ago um very sad case there was very sad cases but a very sad case involving a, a lady in her fifties uh, who 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 suffered. Well, she actually suffered COVID, but then other other things took over. Um, other other medical conditions took over, and she was left in a very very poor state. You know, fully intubated, no consciousness, no awareness, or very little consciousness and awareness, and 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 paralyzed and and probably in quite a bit of pain and one of the questions and, and this is a person who hadn't we, we we weren't aware of all of her wishes and feelings and we got evidence of that from her loved ones amongst other people and, and she had a very loving big family and one of the big questions we grappled with and the judge had to grapple with was what would she want and in answering that question, or in asking and answering that question, there was a big overlap with, well, what would my children want for me? But also, what would my children want for themselves? So sometimes it might feel selfish to say, I want to, could be either way, I want to be kept alive at all costs on a bit, an intubator or ventilator, for, for even if it means I have no quality of life. And there may be a religious element to that or other values. And that might be selfish in that that means that's putting a big burden on your family and, and amongst other people. Or it might be totally altruistic because you don't want, you want to prolong the inevitable and you want to keep your, yourself alive for others, for the sake of others. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So how, uh, that conversation must be quite quite a challenge for the, for the patient themselves to, to work out, to separate what they want and what they would want for their family. Yeah, and, and as you're touching on that, you start to realise how nuanced the conversations need to be. 
and therefore the amount of time that they might take and the amount of skilled facilitation with insight into the possible scenarios that's needed to really form a record that if we needed it at the bedside in an intensive care unit or an emergency department, we would be able to refer to and draw out sufficient information that a best interest decision could be made. And also then who, who would do this? Is, which GP, which district nurse is going to have the time? All the working insights into the emergency department or the intensive care unit. So I think this is a different task and a different workforce that might be required to do this. And it's a conversation also that we need to invite when we encourage people to appoint attorneys to represent them and the the woeful lack of uptake of appointing powers of attorney across the whole of the uk yeah. i should say just, just just for people who are watching if, if they're not aware so lasting power of attorney is is a process whereby someone can appoint can be more than one person, but they can appoint one person or some people um, to make decisions on their behalf at a time they lack capacity, and it can be in relation to their finances and property and affairs. But for this conversation, it can be um, in relation to their health and welfare, and it can include, it will include, often decisions about end of life care. Sorry, just to fill in the the gap there. But I agree with you; the uptake is is shockingly poor. And when it is taken up, it's taken up as a paper exercise. Whereas, in fact, it almost needs to be a conversation exercise that culminates in a piece of paper. It's, it's the, um, the, the social equivalent, really, of what Dr Zoe Fritz is trying to do with the respect form, which is to trigger a conversation about the things that really matter by working through a form not as a question list, but as a kind of um, bulleted list of these are the topics of conversation that need to have been had, and then come back to the piece of paper later and fill it in as far as you can. And it may not yet be complete, but it's a beginning. We desperately need people who are accepting the responsibility of lasting power of attorney, not just to sign all the forms in the right order, but actually have the conversations. I'm one of several brothers and sisters, and we did powers of attorney forms uh, with and for our parents. And I insisted that we did that as a sitting down together as a family, having a conversation. This is pre-COVID, quite a long time pre-COVID, um, when nobody had heard of Zoom and Skype was our um, mm. our method. So some of us who were too far away to be sitting in our parents' house were online with Skype saying, I don't really understand why we need to all be together. Isn't this just about signing some forms in the right order? Because obviously we all want the best for mum and dad and that will be absolutely fine, won't it? And I'm saying, well, on the one level, yes, but on on the other level, um, do you know what mum and dad want about intensive care, about cardiopulmonary resuscitation, about nursing home care? Uh, do you know how we would make a decision since the way the form is written, we can elect to make a decision either where it can't be made until we've all agreed it or one of us can just go off and sort it out and the others will back them up. Um, now, I'm the person who's used to these decisions at work. I do not want to be the person, therefore, who's charged with these decisions for our parents, because I'm much more likely to get to a decision point more quickly because I'm used to weighing these issues up than those of you who just don't work in medicine at all. I almost feel like maybe I shouldn't be one of the attorneys. I should be 
the, the wise old council who talks you lot through it all. And we did consider that as a model for a while. But what we had then was a conversation with our parents about some of their wishes and beliefs, none of which were a huge surprise to any of us, of course, with loving family, we've known each other a long time. But what was interesting was to have, I'm sure you won't mind, just tell, mind me telling you this, our dad say, well, this is what I think, blah, 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 blah. And I know your mum thinks the same. Right. And I know that mum doesn't think the same. And so now we have, oh, okay, mum, well, what, what do you make of that? And when she's given a platform, she says something that, you know, it's not totally different, but it's importantly different. And dad being quite surprised. And yet he is one of her attorneys. So really, really important, isn't it? Also to be able to distill out when we're thinking about these things that we are not being asked what I would want if this was me when we're on attorney. We're being asked what I can say with certainty this person would want and what I can say from having known them a long time and knowing lots of other things about them is probably what they would want because I don't actually know the answer to that very specific question. Yeah. And it's the, it's the platinum rule, not do as you would be done by, but try to do as you know they would wish to be done by. Yeah. And, and the, as you say, the, the big advantage you, your family have over us mortals <laughs> is, is, uh, is you and, and your knowledge of medicine, but also the, the nursing and what it means to be on an incubator, uh, what it means to be um, ventilated, what it means to have CPR. And you mentioned when we we're talking about stories before about soap operas and things. And I know I think um, there's been some papers written about this, the, the ignorance of the public about what it is to be in intensive care. And with, um, with the COVID pandemic, I know people, I think Michael Rosen and various other people have spoken really eloquently about this powerfully. It's not, I mean, it's not pleasant. Pleasant is even not even close. It, it's it's fairly awful. It's a traumatic, as I understand it. I fortunately haven't been in this situation, but having now read these papers, being intubated, uh, even just being in an intensive care ward with beeps and noises going off all the time and constantly people poking you, um, not being you know not being able to tell anyone that you've got a an itch on your foot or or be you're slightly uncomfortable because there's a slight crease in in the sheet underneath you all of these tiny but very important things um are, are, are generally very unknown to all of us unless you happen to work in that world or, or unless you've actually been in that situation yourself so this is the the medical part of it, I suppose. How does how does that conversation, or how and who should have that conversation with a patient, so that they know, and a pre-patient, so that they know what it is they are saying in advance they will tolerate or not tolerate. Yeah, and and I don't really know the answer to that because, you know, we were talking about the parallel of of planning pregnancy and birth. Uh, the options are relatively limited of mm. things that can happen. But the options for us in life are so disparate and often so unexpected. How could you possibly prepare for every eventuality? And that's why I think it's so important that we've distilled the things that matter most out. Because sometimes when we're applying the mental capacity out, we're down to the question about what's the least restrictive option for this person. And um, I think that's asking us also what we're restricting them from. Which option will least restrict their ability to still enjoy the things that mean the most to them? Um, and knowing those things, therefore, is really, really important. Having people who can say, mum 
always said this and somebody else who can corroborate that or that we've written it down or that we've made a little video about it you know we had a conversation about it and we we videoed it we can do that now so easily on zoom um just to find a way of having a record of the person expressing those things that really help them to flourish and then what we're trying to do when we're making really difficult best interest decisions is work out what's the what's the least impediment to their flourishing and for some people dying isn't the worst thing that can happen but for other people for their very particular values very often religious values there's a notion of the moment of our death not being in human hands but being in divine hands or providence hands of some sort and therefore they feel that it's uh, it's forbidden mm. for them to make a wish that includes withdrawal of life supporting treatment and so i think sometimes as as medical workers what we're trying to do is work out at what point treatment is life supporting and when it becomes no longer actually supporting life but supporting only organs mm. and that that sounds almost facile but actually it's incredibly important that people begin treatments with the intention of being made well by them kidney dialysis is a really good example of this kidney failure makes you feel sick it makes you feel tired weary and dialysis isn't a full system reset but you know it's a 75 percent system reset helps people to feel enormously better to start off with but as time goes by over decades the advantages of dialysis are gradually in some people almost completely lost and now were it not for the dialysis the person would have died of their failing kidneys and the treatment that was begun to make them better and it did now is simply protracting their dying and that conversation about whether or not it's permissible to stop the dialysis are you dying from lack of dialysis or are you dying because your kidneys don't work mm. and then we get into the first theological conversations about whether or not it is the divine intervention that has created the dialysis machine um or the doctor or scientists yeah. um, and, and you talked just now about harm and I know it's a very subjective subjective thing, but one of the things that must be very difficult to get across to patients is what they will tolerate or try, try and then for them to articulate first of all, they'd need to know what what it's like what it's going to be like in that situation. but secondly, because as you say, sometimes they have other forces sometimes um, religious beliefs or other reasons to influence their opinions it must be very difficult for them to decide in advance what it is they will tolerate into including harm or pain, severe pain or discomfort yeah it is and of course it's easier to you know it's easier is the wrong word it's it's simpler to identify the likely scenarios, the more advanced into a condition a person is. So if I'm having a conversation like this with somebody who's got a brain tumour in a particular part of their brain, then I know what functions that part of their brain serves. So for one person, we might be having a conversation about as the illness progresses, it might make it increasingly difficult for you to see and to have balance because the tumour is in the very back of your brain and it's affecting the part of your brain that your retina communicates with to tell you what you're seeing and your balance mechanism in your cerebellum. And a different person with a tumour in a different place might be at risk of losing um, speech, being able to talk or being able to understand language or being able to use that arm on one side or their leg or on one side or both. 
Um, so those are very different conversations. And yet there's another part of that conversation, which is both of them now are at increased risk of the pressure in their head getting high, giving them headache or nausea and irritation of the brain causing fits. So as a, as a doctor, I can make plans with them and with their family for what we would do if you've got really bad headaches, um, mm -hmm. what treatments we'd be able to give if you felt very nauseated and what people could do and who people should call if you started to have fits and, and they didn't stop within a few minutes at home. So the conversation is going to cause the person to have insight into what might and yet might not happen as the disease evolves. And that, of course, is distressing for them. So then we're in this territory of trying to respect um, case law, um, so the Tracy verdict particularly comes to mind about this, of it behoves us to give people the information they need to either make a decision for themselves or to understand a medical decision that has been made. So the Tracy verdict was about CPR, of course. Yeah. Um, and I don't think the Tracy family disputed whether the CPR would or would not have been in the patient's best interest. She probably was beyond benefiting, benefiting from CPR. They disputed that neither they nor the patient had been involved in a conversation about the fact that there was a medical decision that CPR was futile. I think that's, is that that's a right-ish right, yeah. reading of it? Yeah, it is. And the, and the outcome, one of the outcomes was, and you mentioned it as the this distinction between harm and distress. So it's very important where it's actually required to have that conversation with the patient in advance uh, and and or their loved ones if the patient lacks capacity. And, and that conversation, as you say, is around CPR. And, and, the, and the point is that this is effectively almost a doctor's decision because as you said before, you can't, no, no one can force a doctor to, to provide treatment that they regard as inappropriate or in this case futile. Yeah. So it's a decision the doctor is making effectively saying we're not going to provide CPR for you. But the Tracy decision is all about telling that patient in advance. Yes. Uh, and but, and but that harming or distressing the patient in having the conversation is a really difficult balance, isn't it? It is. And I think that that judgment um, holds weight beyond discussion only of CPR. I think that we we walk alongside people discussing things that are going to cause them immense distress and yet without having access to the information they can't make the decisions that they need to be able to make. And we meet families who say, oh please don't tell them, don't give them any information, that the shock would kill them. Um, I, you know, I, I know I've known them all these years and you're just a new doctor and you've never met them before and you know, I'm going to come with you and make sure that you don't say anything that you shouldn't say. And that's a really interesting situation to be in because it's entirely motivated by love on the part of the family member. My contract as a doctor is with the patient and to do no harm to the patient. But part of doing no harm to a patient is often not harming people that they love also. Mm. So that being able to say to somebody, right, I, I can't tell a lie. I'm not allowed to tell a lie. Or even I will not tell a lie. But come with me because you know them, you love them, you'll make them feel safe. You'll be able to hear how the conversation goes. You will hear that I will not push if they don't want to have this conversation. But if they do dare to have the conversation, how lovely for them if you're there with them to support them and to hear the conversation and to be part of the conversation too. So rather than going into it defensively, you know, well, don't ask me not to lie to my patient, my relationship with my patient, who do you think you are? To be able to incorporate the love and the concern of that person into helping this conversation to happen. Um, there's there's a story in with the end in mind of going to visit um, an elderly lady who was very sick, very nauseated, and nausea French, was one French of my lady. yeah uh, nausea was one of my my research interests. And I was invited to go and visit this lady at home, and her husband opened the front door and immediately 
took me into a beautifully tidy downstairs room, definitely no patient in here, to explain to me that she didn't know that she had cancer and that I wasn't to tell her because, you know, the shock would kill her. And then he took me upstairs and, oh, she did look really poorly. Um, and she immediately sent him downstairs to make me a cup of tea. And as soon as he was out of the door, she started to tell me that she didn't think that he realised how sick she was and she didn't know how to tell him. Yeah. So this conspiracy of silence, that's born out of love and leaves people in this terribly lonely place. Really, one of the only ways to unpick that is to enable people to be with each other as you start to explore what the illness is, what the current understanding of it is, and they can surprise each other by how much actually they already knew and were kind of looking after each other by not talking about it. Yeah. Very English, English cultural thing, isn't it? But yeah, uh, maybe so. Yeah. Because I thought you were going to say because there's another wonderful story you you tell in the book about a, a French lady who who you treated, I think, quite early on in your career. Yeah. And um, it, it's a really because we, we, we this conversation so far has been around all of the interventions you you may or may not want, and I was talking about positive interventions like ventilation and things but that story about the French lady is really powerful because it it explains to her what the dying process is about uh, I mean uh, and and generally it, well I mean you're, you're you can tell it but it, that, it, that it's not it's not necessarily this traumatic event violent act um and it's probably quite peaceful and presumably that's a very very important aspect of, of these conversations as well it, it's it's a conversation that i don't think i've ever got through in the thousands of times i've had it without tearing up because it's the first time isn't it for for this person and, and their family and it's so moving to watch people um move from the place of horrified, reluctant acceptance that dying is going to happen, but it's going to be like on Hollywood or Coronation Street. And, you know, there'll be lots and lots of suffering and pain and maybe there'll be um, choking and terror and breathlessness. When in fact, just like our bodies are geared to be able to give birth and it's a recognisable process with very clear stages, that decline into dying is another bodily process that's got very clear stages. And the stages are about being more tired, about gradual onset of unconsciousness, and then breathing changes that when the brain is unconscious, automatic breathing starts to kick in. And it's weird to see this breathing because we don't see deeply unconscious people and their breathing cycles under any other circumstances. If somebody was so deeply unconscious that they were down to automatic breathing cycles in any other circumstance, they'd be in an intensive care unit on a ventilator. So that breathing um, moves between cycles of being slow and fast, backwards and forwards, and it moves between deep breathing and shallow breathing, backwards and forwards. As the person's unconsciousness deepens, the ability of the nerves in the rest of their body to communicate with their brain diminishes so they no longer feel the back of their throat. They probably no longer feel anywhere in the body, but the significance of not feeling the back of your throat is twofold. The first is that it's so richly innervated in order to protect the airway. We know that if a crumb or a little bit of fluid were to touch the back of our throats, ordinarily we would cough or swallow or splot up to clear it straight away but here they are usually lying on their back and so you know, a teaspoonful of saliva or the fluid that we use to keep people's mouths clean and moist can lie at the back of the throat it doesn't get in the way of the airway the air keeps going in and out but because there's fluid it bubbles and it makes a bizarre noise a clicking noise people call it the death rattle 
what it tells me is this person is so deeply unconscious they can't even feel the back of their throat anymore. You know, they are they are safe in their unconsciousness. But actually, because families haven't heard it before, they remember it as something terrible. They think the person is drowning. They think that the fluid is not just a teaspoon at the back of the throat, but is is actually welling up from their lungs and overcoming them and drowning them. So it's important that we can help people to understand that's what the process looks like. And it's also important that we help people to understand that if there are symptoms during the person dying, you know, if they are breathless or they have pain or those sorts of things, those things aren't happening because they're dying. Those things are happening because of the illness that they've got from which they are dying. So if they've needed painkillers so far, they will continue to need those painkillers. And we have to find different ways of giving them once the person's not awake enough to swallow. And the process should not be painful. It should not be uncomfortable. And if it is painful, and if it is uncomfortable, we want families not to think, oh, well, they're dying. What do you expect? Isn't this terrible? We want the family to pick up the phone to whoever is the right person for where they are and say, my person is uncomfortable. Come now and sort this out so that we can use the clever medicines we've got to relieve the symptoms and allow the dying process to just simply continue in the background. So really important that families understand that as it's happening, that we guide them through it, like midwives do during labour. This is this thing that we've already talked about, and now this is what it's like when it's happening. Preparation first, and then real-time narrative. And we need to bring that back in to practice for the process of dying as well. So the story that you're telling is my boss describing this process to a dying, elderly, slightly intimidating French woman who'd been a member of the French resistance in the Second World War and was married, married a British airman and, and now was a widow living in, in England. But the thing that was a game changer for me was I'd been qualified about five years by then. I'd worked in very acute settings, wanting to be a cancer specialist. And so I was looking for jobs that took me to the most sick people to be the best doctor I could be in those settings, emergency department, intensive care unit, acute medical breaks, those sorts of things. So I'd seen lots of dying before I made my sideways move out of cancer care and go and work in a hospital. And yet, as he was describing the process of dying to this woman, to start off with, when he said, would you like me to describe what dying is usually like? In my, you know, 26-year-old, I know everything brain, I'm thinking, well, you can't do that because every death is different. Obviously, every death is different. And then as he's describing to her, and she's entranced, sitting up, nodding, stroking his hand, absolutely taken in and comforted and consoled by what he's telling her. I'm sitting on my little stool beside the bed with my brain completely exploding. First of all, how have I never noticed this? Because as he's describing it, I'm realising, yeah, actually, this is what happens. And I have seen this hundreds of times. How did I not notice? Oh, well, I know how I didn't notice. I was too busy worrying about the ventilator settings in that patient and the potassium levels in that patient and how much bleeding that patient was having, what the person's kidneys were doing. I didn't step back and see the pattern behind it all. And then the other mind-blowing thing was, goodness me, not only can we describe a process of the way human bodies die, we can describe that process to an actually imminently dying person and it doesn't horrify them. It consoles them. So we can talk about conversations that say we can give these treatments and those treatments and the other treatments and that in fact might defer your dying by days or weeks. Or we can not do those things, in which case this is the pattern of events that we expect will follow in terms of how people's bodies respond to the process of dying. So now we're not just saying, well, these are the treatments, take them or leave them. We're saying, here are the two routes that are open to you. 
one of which has to be in hospital, has to be involving these machines and technology, and that may be your preference. And surviving till your granddaughter is born in Australia in eight weeks' time might be the most important thing to do. You might live eight weeks anyway. If we didn't do those things, you would be able to do that at home. This is the sequence of events that we would expect. This is how we'll work beside you to make sure that your symptoms don't come back and trouble you. And now there's a decision to be made that with proper information about the alternatives. And I think because doctors haven't been good at understanding the process of dying, they haven't been good at describing what the alternative to just constantly escalating interventions would be. And we've seen the consequences of that again on the other side of the Atlantic. And that's what Atul Gawande's mm. being mortal really is, is a call to arms for his fellow professionals to get off the interventions escalator and start to think about how to offer comfort and companionship along the dying pathway rather than just pretending that we can continue to avoid allowing a death to happen. So these, again, are consoling, surprisingly consoling conversations. And at the end of each of those conversations of describing what dying would look like, I always offer at the beginning to stop if it gets too hard. And nobody has ever stopped me. One person's wife stopped me and asked me to leave the house. And they phoned me the next day because apparently he'd read the riot act afterwards. And I was brought back to finish the conversation, but she couldn't bear it. And, and, and I, I think was probably so focused on him that I didn't clock how distressed she was coming and I should have withdrawn earlier. So that was, that was my fault. But almost always what happens is at the end of the conversation, there's this kind of, oh, that isn't what I was expecting. That's so much less awful than I was expecting. Will you tell my wife that? Will you tell my kids that? Will you tell my family that? I, I think we can do that. I think we can manage that. And so now we're not in a kind of vacuum of knowledge. There's a process. We can see that you're losing energy month by month. We're still dealing in a life expectancy of month. Okay, so really we're seeing a change now from one week to the next. We're talking about a life expectancy that's probably measurable in weeks, maybe enough weeks to make a month or so, but not years anymore. And time goes by, energy is fading day by day, hour by hour. Sleepiness is overtaking the person, periods of unconsciousness with unconscious breathing. And what's been lovely about writing about this and putting that information out into the public space is the letters I get back from people saying, I hadn't understood what happened when this first person died. I was horrified by the noises. I thought they were choking. So I feel better now because I've understood it. But when this other person was dying, I recognised the process from those descriptions, from the stories. And I, one family wrote and said, um, it was very late at night and the nursing uh, staff had just changed over and a lovely nurse came. She said, oh, you look really tired. Why don't you go home, have a good night's sleep and I'll phone you if anything happens and come back in the morning. And my sister and my husband were picking up their coats and I looked at mum and I said to them, no, we're not going. Her breathing is changing. And I wouldn't have known to look for that before. But actually, she died before we would have been able to get home to take the phone call from the nurse to come back. So we give people options and power by giving them information. And I think it's really, really important that you do. Yeah, and fear of the unknown, I suppose, is is something that needs to be overcome. And the best way to overcome that is to to to, to know. Yeah. <laughs> to be have something explained to them. I mean, look, Catherine, uh, we could talk for hours, and and I, and I feel we need to clone you so that we can you can you can be in every single hospital and primary care unit around the country or around the world to um to be able to have these conversations. I think that the next best thing is people to read your book books and to to watch your various talks and to, to learn from your 
amazing wisdom and on all, on all of these really difficult conversations and difficult subjects but actually when when you have when you explain them to me just now and to, to the listeners um i i realize that they, they do have light to them and they're not um as, as someone said with the uh with the death in mind they might have a very um depressing title but actually it's quite uplifting and and i think a lot of these conversations can be um surprisingly uplifting and it, and it means that you can have a career of working in that space and go home every day actually feeling more more positive things than sorrow have happened in a day yeah uh, and the more conversations that are had around the these difficult but important subjects with all patients the fewer the fewer cases that will need to go to the court of protection because it will be much more obvious to all clinicians and loved ones what this patient would want if they could communicate those wishes and values and feelings at the time so Catherine I, I'm going to say thank you very very much for spending the time on on all of these topics um, as I say I could talk for hours um, we, you mentioned Zoe Fritz, Dr. Zoe Fritz, and the respect process. We had a seminar um, in December, which um, she was she was fant uh, fantastic at speaking on on the respect process um, with uh, Professor Imogen Gould and Rebecca Langley. Um, so people can have a watch back on that. It's on our on our website if anyone wants to have a look at it because it's um, also covers some of these very important topics. So. Thank you very much and um, hope to see you very soon. Thank you so much.